Everybody gets 30 seconds to finish what they're doing on their phone. 30 seconds. <laughs> and then you're putting it down. This is important. Are you ready? OK. This is important. This is, we're talking about $2 billion as of our last estimates when I was in the department working for then Secretary King on this very fight. We're talking about $2 billion that are going within districts in state and local dollars every year, not to the highest poverty schools. So like, we all know that there are property taxes that make between district inequities, right? That make spending unfair between districts. This whole conversation today is not about that. It's about the much lesser known inequity within districts, right? Schools that have higher concentration of poverty are the ones getting Title $1 within a district. And they are getting across the country in way too many places, fewer state and local dollars than the lower need schools in their district to the tune of about $2 billion each year. That's a problem. And if we're a federal government, I don't want to speak for the congressman, I know he had to take off, but if I were him and I knew we were spending about $15 billion every year in Title I, and that a full $2 billion of that was going to fill in holes in unfair state and local funding within districts, I would be concerned. Right? Like, that's not a great start to how we're spending a total of $15 billion, just right off the top, $2 billion of it, going to fill in holes in state and local funding that isn't fairly allocated to Title I schools within districts. And it is, I really appreciate the history that we got. I think this, is a, this really is an important conversation to ground ourselves in history. And in particular, I think I was actually just looking at the LDF, the, legal, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund report before I came over here to remind myself, because not only did it find egregious misuse of funds like golden bathtubs or, you know, whatever, the, the real point of that report was that it documented time and time again that the way district leaders were spending Title I funds, and particularly district leaders in the South, but not just in the South, were using Title I dollars, were to allow them to free up their own precious state and local dollars to spend more in white schools or more affluent schools, but at the moment what they were calling white schools, right? And that history is very real. It was very intentional. It was documented over and over again. Title I dollars being used instead of to provide supplemental additional services, it was being used to like build the classroom, literally put books in a library, buy desks, like things that you should not be spending Title I supplemental dollars on for additional support and services, basic core functions of schools. So with that context is why we got the supplement not supplement requirement in the first place, as we heard, as we heard from Mike. And unfortunately, it's not, as, as we heard, it's not working. We're still at this place where we're spending $2 billion less across the country within districts and high need schools. Congress, um, I think wisely, I would say, tried to change the way we were enforcing Supplement Not Supplant in this last Every Student Succeeds Act. But just for like brief history for those, or I don't wanna say history because we got so much great history, but just for brief re relative context, what we used to do for like 30 years, the way an auditor would go out and actually test and say like, are you meeting the requirements to spend your Title One dollars in a supplemental way, is they would go and say, tell me what you're buying. And they would ask some questions about that. Is it required by state and local law? If so, you probably shouldn't be spending Title One dollars on it. That's probably supplanting. Is it paid for by state and local dollars in other schools in your district that aren't getting Title One funds? If so, that's probably supplanting. You shouldn't be spending your Title One dollars on that. Is it being? Are you using state and local dollars on the same thing in other schools? If so, that's probably supplanting. You shouldn't be using your Title One dollars on that. They got rid of that because people were complaining that that was giving auditors a whole lot of power to like say you can't spend your Title One dollars on certain things, and that was like limiting innovation and creativity. And that's fair. Like we heard a lot of that, and that I think that there's some truth to that. So then they said, "All right, we'll take that out of the law. In fact, we'll outlaw using those three presumptions." But they didn't really write anything in about what auditors should do instead. And they left that to us at the Department of Education. So in the year before the Obama administration turned into pumpkins and got kicked out of office after um, ESSA was passed, we ran around, I ran around like a crazy person trying to see if we couldn't pass some regulations to put some teeth to what this meant. 
uh, I can tell you, I tried really hard. I was really pregnant, and we did. I hardly slept, but we did not get it over the finish line. <laughs> um, and I think, the, but the proposal that we had on the table at the time was really simple. It was exactly what what Mike said, which was if every school Title I school in your district is getting at least as much per student in a year in state and local dollars as the average you're spending in all the non-Title I schools, you're good. We don't care what you spend the Title I dollars on. By definition, they are supplementing your state and local dollars. If they are just mathematically, if the state and local dollars are spending at least as much as in your non-Title I schools. We didn't get it over the finish line for a whole lot of reasons that I'm happy to talk about. Uh, in Q&A, we had both some political pushback of those who didn't want to disrupt the status quo. We had some concerns, similar to what Mike talked about, about uh, whether we were going to do something that would unintentionally sort of force teachers to move from school to school, which I think we shared that concern and absolutely thought that would be terrible policy, didn't want to do that. And so we tried to think about in ways to avoid that, right, making sure that you could phase it in over five years or over a longer period of time to help you can, you can make these kinds of changes without forcing teachers to transfer. Nobody, at least nobody that I've ever taken seriously, thinks that's a good idea. Um, but there were, I think there were some people who really wanted to protect the status quo. There were other people who just wanted to make sure we were doing it thoughtfully and weren't uh, creating unintentional consequences, which certainly I have a lot of understanding for. So we didn't get it over the finish line. We now are in this place where, um, as Mike said, instead what we have is guidance that just says that uh, auditors who are trying to enforce Title I supplement not supplant requirements should go around and make sure that school districts have a Title I neutral approach to allocating state and local dollars, which as far as I can tell just literally means you don't actually write down on a piece of paper anywhere. We're taking, we're giving fewer dollars to our Title I schools. We're giving fewer title state and local dollars to our Title I schools. Like, as long as you don't, aren't stupid enough to write it down that that's what you're doing, my read is you can do whatever you want. So, I mean, I'm no Department of Ed lawyer these days, but that is how I would read it. So it is a wild swing toward lack of regulation and lack of oversight, which means that it is up to equity-oriented practitioners and state leaders and district leaders and equity-oriented advocates to really try to move the needle on this. And so at EdTrust, that's what we are working on. One of the things that we're working on is trying to help equity advocates in particular think about how to really push for change in their district, right? Because this is a very district, I mean, states and the feds can play a role in being the sort of backstop requiring districts to do the right thing. But if they're not going to do that at the end, this is a conversation at the local school board and superintendent level. And so one of the new tools that ESSA has provided state advocates with in this space is <laughs> that it has required every state to publish school level spending data starting now, starting this year. We've got about 15 states or so now, I think, that have published those data, growing every, every month or so. And so d advocates who want to take this on can. They can go out and they can download the data from their state and they can look and see, well, are the schools in my district spending fairly or are they not? And are we spending less in our higher need schools? Although I will say the way states are reporting that data, frankly, right now is abysmal. It is very, very hard to make heads or tails out of it. It's like buried on page 85 of their website. It is just a list of schools with dollar amounts next to it without any real way of seeing patterns across needs. Like on a, even on Massachusetts's website, which we think of as one of the best states in the country for presenting data, it just shows here's, here's Boston, here's how much we spend overall per student. Here's how much of it comes from the feds, from the states and from the local. And then I could go pick an individual school, but I can't see a pattern. I can't see like, how are we spending on higher need schools versus lower need schools, which is nonsense. Like they should, that's an easy thing to show using, you know, Excel. It wouldn't, wouldn't be too hard, but, um, but they're not doing that. So anyways, I think those are the two, the ESSA gave us a new supplement on supplement opportunity. We tried to take it. We didn't get over the finish line. And then they gave us new school level data. And so now we are trying to help equity oriented advocates use that to push for similar kinds of change in their districts. And it's a really important opportunity. I will say finally, just for anyone who is thinking about this from a state perspective, state leaders have a ton of opportunity here. Like state leaders are the are the pass through for federal dollars. And if they want to, they can absolutely 
increase the bar on what districts are doing with those state dollars here and otherwise. So they could require state, require districts, they may not be able to require them to exactly meet the supplement house plant bar we were talking about, but they could be asking a lot of these questions and pushing the needle and making this important if they wanted to. So state chiefs could certainly be playing a role here if they really wanted to take on this important piece of the puzzle. And then maybe the last thing I'll say is just that we're hearing presidential candidates left and right propose lots of new federal dollars in public education, which is awesome. Like, obviously, I think all of us in this room think that is a great idea. And most of them are doing it with some sort of equity lens, like with some sort of targeting toward districts with high concentration of need. And that also is awesome. I really hope that it, if and when any of these proposals come to bear and actually start to be taken seriously and written into legislation or written into regulation, that it also includes a provision to tackle this within district inequities. Because if we're serious about federal dollars getting to the kids who need it the most and the educators who need it the most who are serving those kids, we should be taking this on and we should be taking it seriously and we should be writing it down and we shouldn't be leaving it up to the whim of district leaders or secretaries of education that maybe don't want to take it on. Okay, that's my less than full time, I think. Thank you. Um, and now, we, we will now go to Bruce, and Bruce's um, slide, slide show is also, his PowerPoint is also in, in your packets. Um, um, just if you're having a hard time seeing it or if you wanna make sure you have a record, just be aware of that. 